So listen, I want to encourage you guys. I don't know if you've ever read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. How many of you guys have read through the Bible? All right, well, that's really good. Um, I want to enc encourage you guys to continue to do that. You know, I think um, one of the most beneficial things I've done for my spiritual walk is just to read through the scriptures and then to reread through the scriptures. And you guys know what happens. You start to tie everything together. Um, already on this trip, you know, we've talked about the book of Genesis, we've talked about the book of Revelation, and we've talked about a lot in the middle. And so we need to be students of the word. But here in this place, uh, and like I said to you, we were going to make a transition from the kingdom of Saul to the kingdom of David. And we're just going to talk really briefly today about the conflict between the two of them because there was, there was a lot of conflict. You remember as we read the story in 1 Samuel that the kingdom had been torn away from Saul. And uh, remember Samuel went to the house of who? And Dora. No. Samuel went to the house of Jesse mm -hmm. and remember God was God was doing a work. God was selecting a new king. And so Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, alive the oldest of the families before him. Samuel's looking with the eyes of man, right? The, the, the cultural eyes. Oldest, tallest, strongest, handsomest. This is the dude for sure. And uh, he's, he says, behold the Lord's anointed is before me. And God says, no, nope, not him. So son by son and God's like nope not him next I mean it's kind of a cool process to think about being a part of all the way to the point where there there was nobody else you know Jesse wasn't offering up at least anybody else and so Samuel says uh, dude this is my modern vernacular dude do you have any more sons and he's like well there's a, a little guy out in the field but he's a little ruddy little guy really not of any value or of any use and God says to Samuel, listen, um, I don't evaluate like man evaluates. Man looks on the outside. Do you remember? He says, I look at the heart. And so this little insignificant nothing shepherd boy is brought before. I mean, can think about it from, from David's perspective. You know, he's being brought before the greatest prophet in all of Israel. He takes out the horn of oil. He anoints him king. Like, can you imagine what David was feeling? Can you imagine what the other brothers were thinking or what Jesse was thinking? <laughs> Listen, or what Samuel was thinking. You know, what a wake-up call for Sa Samuel that God does not evaluate based on external criteria. I, listen, this is not the point of the message today, but please, let's remember God does not evaluate based on ex external criteria. We do. You know, uh, how much money, what kind of car, where do you live, what's your education, who do you hang with? And based on those things, there's this pecking order we establish in society. God doesn't look that way. He looks past all of that. That really doesn't mean much. And he looks to the heart. So David is anointed king. Did David get the kingdom right away? No. No. So he didn't, he, he didn't get the kingdom. In fact, he uh, went to the house of Saul. Remember, we don't have a chance to go to the Valley of Elah. But uh, there he slays Goliath. Um, Saul has got serious internal issues. David is brought in. He's a sweet psalmist. He, he plays the harp. He comes into the house of Saul. He uh, plays his music. It calms Saul's heart. Pretty soon David is raised up. He's one of the great generals in the army. There was a song that was being sung. Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. And now there's competition between the king and this little shepherd nothing boy. And David is pursued by Saul. Um, and this is one of the places, this is one of the reasons I love to come here. Uh, David loved this place. He, he loved the Judean wilderness. He loved this place. This was his uh, wilderness fortress. He had, as he was fleeing from Saul, there were 600 or so very rugged men. Uh, they were a motley crew. They were in some ways the dregs of society. They became David's mighty men. And this was the place that they would hang out. Now, now listen, um, we haven't seen a lot of Ibex or Rock Badgers yet, but typically when we start this hike, there are uh, Ibexes, uh, which is, they're like mountain goats, like tons of them all over the place. We're gonna walk past some rock badgers. Um, we're gonna go all the way to the top 
and there's a, a beautiful waterfall. It, if you are establishing a fortress for yourself and 600 men, what are the, some of the things that you need? Water. You need water, you need food, you need, you need shelter, you need, you, it's got to be strategic, right? I mean, this was one of the most strategic places. And so, so here David is, so I want you to think about this, 3,000 years ago, David was here in this valley. And he's fleeing from Saul. And he writes two psalms, okay? I want to read these psalms to you. And then we're going to go to the story that uh, is the backdrop of why David wrote these psalms. So, so here David is. He's being pursued by Saul. And he's hiding. See those caves up there? Yes. He's hiding in one of those caves. Wow. Like, I don't know which cave it was. I haven't had the chance to go over and check that out. Um, don't let me forget. Sonny said he hid his dreadlocks here somewhere. That's something that we have to... Did you guys come to that? Vegas Lights? Yeah. You guys got to start coming to Vegas Lights. All right, that's another story. Psalm 57. He's hiding in a cave. He says this. To the chief musician, set to do not destroy a mitchtim of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. So David's hiding. Saul's army is here. And this is what he pens as a psalm to God. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you and in the shadow of your wings. I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. Obviously, he's talking about Saul. He says, Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They've prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They've dug a pit before me into the midst of it. They themselves have fallen. Selah. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake my glory. Awake lute and harp. I will awake in the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord. Think about this, like the prayer hasn't even been answered and David's praising God. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. And then in uh, Psalm 142, a contemplation of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. I cry out to the Lord with my voice, with my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path and the way in which I walk. They've secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, for there's no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you're my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry. For I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. All right, so this is the situation. David is writing these psalms to God. He's in trouble. He's in a cave. He's being pursued by Saul. And um, this is the story. 1 Samuel 24. So this is the story, okay? Just picture this in your mind. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was said to him, saying, Take note, David's in the wilderness of En Gedi. So right here. Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel, and he went to seek David and his men on the Rock of the Wild Goats. Okay, do you know where the Rock of the Wild Goats is at? Yeah, it's right behind you. Normally, it's too hot. They're like having tea somewhere, I think. They're cooling <laughs> off. Uh, but, but normally that hill has tons of ibex on it. So Saul's got 3,000 guys. They've come to seek David. Verse 3, so he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend to his needs. And what was happening? David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. So it's Paul's, or excuse me, Saul has got to use the restroom. That's basically the modern translation. He's got to go potty. And so what happens? David's been, this is David's prayer. David, or, or God, save me. I'm surrounded. I've sought refuge. Um, and my refuge isn't holding up. He's in a cave. 
And what happens? The very cave. There's a lot of caves here. Yeah. The very cave that David is hiding in, Saul goes in to do his business. And so this is what happens. Verse 4. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hands, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So the guys were like, David, uh, you can't get any more vulnerable than this, okay? Uh, he's laid it all down. He's using the restroom. You got your opportunity. Wipe him out. David... Uh, you know, it was too much for David to do. So what does he do? He goes over to the robe that Saul had laid down and he cuts a section of the robe off. Verse five, now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave, went on his way. And David also arose afterwards, went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My lord, the king. And when, when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of the men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? Look this day, your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Just a couple more verses here. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see, the corner of your robe, it's in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I've not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me. Let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but David says, my hand shall not be against you. And then he says, after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog, a flea? He's like, what am I? Why are you even pursuing me? And then he says, let the Lord judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me uh, out of your hand. So listen, I just want to bring a little bit of application here, okay? David is praying. His prayer is, God, deliver me. God, I'm being falsely accused. I'm being pursued. Um, even my rock wilderness fortress is of no use. And so he prays, deliver me from the hand of my enemy. What does God do? He delivers Saul into the hand of David. I mean, this it almost seems like the answer to his prayers, right? Here is Saul. Even the guys that were surrounding David were saying, now's your chance, man, take him out. But listen, this is what distinguished David from other men. David was a man who had a heart after God's own heart. When the situation was set before him, and, and he had the opportunity, David chose to do the right thing. David chose to honor God. He knew that even though Saul was in the wrong, even though Saul was in the wrong, David had determined in his heart not to do the wrong thing. Remember with me, Saul, in, in, when David was in Saul's house, Saul was slinging spears. When, when people sling spears at you, do you pull them off the wall and sling them back? You know, you, you've, got, you've got Saul who, who's pursued David and is seeking to take his life. Do you avenge yourself? Do, do you take it upon yourself when the opportunity is given to respond when you're reviled or when there's gossip or when there's slander? You know, Peter laid down a principle for us just in following the example of Jesus Christ. He said, Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not return a reviling with the reviling. There was something in the heart of David that, that I believe we need to emulate, and that's this. He was a man after God's own heart. When the situation provided itself, I'm not saying David was perfect. Was David perfect? No. He made some mistakes. I mean, he sinned pretty seriously. What did he do when he sinned? He repented. And so, listen, as the opportunities are placed before us, and we don't talk about this a lot in church today, but we need to choose righteousness. We need to do what's right. Listen, not in our eyes, not in the eyes of our culture. We need to do what's right in the eyes of God. And the Bible says that the life that is doing those things that is right in the eyes of God will be a blessed life. Amen? Amen.